Kyrie Sane returns at WWE Crown Jewel. Could there be a major new WWE faction on the way? War Games is official for Survivor Series later this month, and the NWA's recent TV deal with the CW is already in some trouble because daft things happened. Hello and welcome to the Solo Sunday News here at What Culture Wrestling with myself, Andrew Pollard. I hope you're well. I hope your weekend's uh, going as well as possible. Uh, right, let's get straight into it. WWE Crown Jewel took place yesterday from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and one of the most notable things to come out of the premium live event was the WWE return of Kyrie Sane. Yes, the Pirate Princess, the former NXT Women's Champion, the former WWE Women's Champion and of course, the inaugural IWGP Women's Champion. Yes, Kyrie returned, giving the assist to EO Sky as EO retained her WWE Women's Championship against Bianca Belair. Now, this is a very interesting proposition because by all accounts, it seemed the way it was presented, at least anyway, it seemed as if Bailey had no idea that this was happening. Of course, Bailey, Eo Sky, and Dakota Kai are damage control. And so Bailey was taken a little bit aback by the presence of Kyrie Sane. Um, and if you think back to 2020 when Kyrie left the company, it was what July 2020 was written off TV. That was down to a backstage assault from. Bailey. So there we go. Um, Kyrie, of course, left the company to return uh, back to Japan. Uh, her contract ran out, expired the following year. She served as an ambassador for the company during that time. Uh, and then when that expired, she returned to stardom at the start of last year. As mentioned, won the IWGP Women's Championship, the first one ever at the end of last year. A belt that she dropped to Mercedes Monet earlier this year. I believe it was February. So Kyrie's back. Um, and just to, to kind of dovetail off this story, this new story, into there could well be a faction that forms as part of this. Yes, there's a, a Reddit insider, Kermit125, and also Fightful Select have backed this up as well. Basically, there's been discussions backstage of having Eosky, Kyrie Sane, and then possibly two other people. So th there's big questions there over the future of damage control. That faction could be on the rocks. Um, now, the, the stories here in terms of uh, who could be in this faction with Carrie and uh, and EO? Um, one of the terms used by Kermit125 was another friend, and another term used was no one is ready. So, of course, a lot of people are speculating that this could be Asuka because nobody's ready for Asuka. No one's ready for Asuka. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's also been an another kind of throw-off from this as well, is that another name is someone that no one will see coming. So we could have Asuka, we could have a total left-field swerve surprise name. Hey, maybe it's Mercedes Monet. She is a free agent. Um, but yes, this is uh, this is something that's got my attention, definitely. I just think there's a lot of, of fun dynamics at play. I mean, Kyrie saying being back in WWE is great for WWE, great for its women's division because Kyrie's just one of the best on the planet. Um, and to, to see her used under the stewardship of Triple H, that's also intriguing because, let's face it, Vince McMahon, the, the Vince McMahon days didn't do great for Kyrie saying much up to the main roster. There were, there were some bright sparks, but yeah, this has my attention very much so because of that dynamic, like I mentioned, with, with Bailey, with damage control. Where does this go from here? And yes, we may get a new big faction out of this. And I'm I'm all for that. I'm, I'm Yeah, that's that sounds cool to me. Uh, and also what sounds cool to me is that in a matter of what, three weeks, we will be getting War Games. Is it three weeks? Yeah, it's three weeks. Um, November the 25th from Chicago's Allstate Arena is Survivor Series this year. And Crown Jewel yesterday saw it announced that, yes, War Games, after much speculation, will be returning for a second outing at Survivor Series in just a matter of weeks. Do we get that William Regal announcement? Maybe, maybe. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm not sure where the timeline is with Regal. I know it was a year after he left AW. He was supposed to be uh, kept off TV. He wasn't allowed to be a TV presence. Um, if not, there's always, you know, you've got stock clips of him shouting or screaming at War Games, which uh, always puts a smile on the face. But yes, War Games is back this year. There's no news on um, what teams will be involved. Although, interestingly, the announcement did feature footage of both the, the male and the female talent. So that to me suggests that we'll be getting a, a men's and a women's War games match on one side i mean judgment day seems like a, a very much a shoe in to be in there you could easily put them against say cody rose jay uso sammy zayn and, and you know a couple of other baby faces that have had beef with judgment day there's also that that kind of i guess working relationship we saw established the other week with rhea ripley and paul Heyman. so could there be bloodline involvement as well who knows um and on the, the women's side you'd think damage control there that that's 
that could be an interesting part of war games because as mentioned if uh, especially if eos sky is going to be leaving the group you can do something there but war games is great man i mean it was only the last year was the first time it was used on the main roster because vince mcmahon famously did not like war games so instead it was used in nxt dating back to what 2017 i guess it would have been um of course the concept itself the, the match beyond war games was created by dusty Rhodes back in 1987 for jim crockett promotions and will go on to become synonymous with the nwa and wcw which is part of the reason why Vince probably didn't like it because, hey, it reminds people of another company and of a good time. So, yeah, War Games is on the way. Again, has my interest, has my intrigue. And one thing that had my intrigue last weekend in a, a totally different way of just like, have you really just done that on pay-per-view? Even if it's not actually really doing that, have you? Yeah. Um, if you didn't see it, the NWA last weekend, their Sam Hain pay-per-view uh, did a spot where uh, the Sinister Minister, Father James Mitchell, was uh, partying in the crowd in a, a private area um, where the, the commentary team threw to him out there. He was there in the crowd with a, a, a bunch of ladies. They were swigging booze from the bottle. And then, then you notice that, that Father James Mitchell has... Um, some white powder with him, which is kind of alluded to being cocaine, yes. And then he proceeds to snort some of this white powder. And you've got Joe Galley, you've got you've got Tim Storm, bless Tim Storm. Um, yeah, and you've got Danny Deals, all kind of like, oh my God, look, he's partying to the excess. I wish I was over there. And it's like, I, I don't know if, if that's something you want to be doing on pay-per-view or on your TV or anything in your wrestling product where you kind of pretend that your performers uh, are... <laughs> or snorting cocaine and anyway yes someone else who had some similar reservations about that was the cw now the cw in case you missed this news have recently agreed uh basically two two tv two tv deals that's easy for me to say caffeinated this morning uh two tv deals with the nwa one to show nwa power on a weekly basis and the other one is for a new reality tv series based around the nwa and so these agreements have been put in place. The, the shows were going to be airing on the CW as in the channel, the network. Now, though, maybe not so much. Um, House of Wrestling, Nick Houseman, uh, reported this now that CW executive, CW higher ups have uh, on have not been impressed by the Sam Hain antics with the uh, the cocaine and, and the sinister minister. And as such, it now looks like both Power and this new reality TV series rather than being shown on tv it's just they're going to be exclusive to the cw app which obviously takes away a lot more of your potential viewership um house arrest has said it's 90 percent certain this will be the case um but of course there is always a chance that talks happen and it's like you know okay sorry we messed up um please keep us on tv actual tv rather than just relegating us to an app in, in which case i mean you could argue would you be better off just being on youtube for free uh so so yes just very daft i, I, I when when i saw this clip during the rounds it was just like really why when was this ever a good idea and this report also notes that the idea was from billy corgan yes william patrick corbin himself decided corbin did i say corbin Corgan, William Patrick Corgan himself uh, wanted this idea and pushed for it to be on the pay-per-view. And so, I mean, if there's any pushback on this, which there clearly looks like there is, Billy Corgan's got nobody to blame but himself. Um, probably the, the the daftest decision he's made since making Tyrus the world champion for so long. God, but but that's, that's over. The dark days are over. They're not. Man, the NWA used to be so great. That initial run of Powers, uh, the, the initial first few pay-per-views when they came back and it was a, a weekly TV program. And you had Nick Aldis, the national treasure. You had Ricky Starks. You had Eddie Kingston. You had Eli Drake or L.A. Knight. Yeah, uh, you had Thunder Rosa being made a big deal of because she was the only person that had entrance music. There was Camille coming through. There was just there was a lot going on. There was a lot of great stuff going on. James Storm, Colt Cabana. Yeah, there was. <laughs> and you look at it now, and it's like it's just so unrecognizable in terms of a visual well in terms of a visual in terms of the aesthetic in terms of the booking in terms of the talent it's just <sighs> yeah anyway so uh the nwa i'm not gonna go off on the big tangent there which i kind of did but i'll <laughs> i'll swing back back around now to your questions because there's been a few questions that have come in this morning uh, first and foremost, Dustin Sensenet. Okay, Dustin, uh, do you think anyone will or should take up the mantle for The Fiend, or was it a strictly a Bray Wyatt character? I was saying for Halloween this year, and that's a fantastic effort. Fair play, Dustin. That's a, a great fancy dress outfit there. Uh, as for should anybody take up The Fiend um, mantle in, in place of, of, of Bray Wyatt? No, I, I think you just leave that alone. That's, that's Bray Wyatt's thing. 
Um, I, I think it'd probably be, well, I, I know it will be, to me, it'd come across a bit distasteful if somebody else all of a sudden was the fiend and they were dressing like the fiend and they were doing fiend stuff and there was, you know, fun house, happy house of horrors and all stuff and whatever. Just like, yeah, not the Firefly Fun House. Not, not for me. I think that you just leave that. That's Bray Wyatt's thing. He's sadly no longer with us. Let the fiend rest with him. I mean, you can do other things tying into that maybe. I mean, if, if Bo Dallas came, was, if he wanted to come back, then you could, I mean, there's something there you could do with a reveal from Uncle Howdy and then he goes off in his own direction. But I just think anything to do with The Fiend, you just, uh, you leave that be, unfortunately. Uh, right, where else are we? Um, Paul's got in such Paul eyes on me. Uh, not a question, but more an observation. Uh, Roman is breaking Hogan's record, isn't he? Well, what are you going to do, brother? Uh, I... I don't think he does. Uh, it depends if you mean cumulative, uh, because I actually did some numbers on this one because I saw this question come in. Because, I mean, in terms of single reigns, Hogan's longest one is 1,474 days. That was from when he beat the Iron Sheik in January 84 to when he lost technically to Andre the Giant in, in February 88 with a double referee, uh, the, the, the Hebner switch. Uh, and then obviously that title was vacated because it got given to Ted DiBiase straight away. And yeah, so uh, Hogan's first reign was 1,474 days. Roman reigns, as of this writing this recording because i'm not writing hands are here no writing going on as of this talking uh he is uh i believe 1157 um so <laughs> there's there's a lot to go there uh basically you're looking at an extra 300 days to add on uh now if if roman was to get to say wrestlemania 40 night two and he was to drop that title to i don't know Cody Rhodes, LA Knight, a returning to Tanka. I am here for that. Absolutely here for that. I get ridiculed in the office and write Tanka love, and I'm I'm happy to take that ridicule because God love that man. Anyway, uh, yeah. So if if Roman could get get to WrestleMania and lose it there, that would take him up to one thousand three hundred and eleven days, which is still you know <laughs> another hundred and fifty uh, or so short of Hulk Hogan. So, I mean, realistically, if, if he was to beat Hogan's reign, then Roman would need to keep onto the belt until what? SummerSlam, essentially. Can you say, would people tolerate that? Would people be open to Roman Reigns keeping uh, that, that title right the way through? Uh, probably not. So, so yeah, I don't think he's going to catch uh, Hogan that, that first reign. Um, but also, one person that gets overlooked in this as well, and I, I find it weird that they just don't talk about him, because from what I understand, there's no bad terms there, there's no beef. Um, it's Bob Backlund, because yes, Bruno Sammartino has the longest record for a single reign with, what, 2,800 something days. Bob Backlund has like a, a sturdy over 2,000 day record, but that's like not acknowledged. There's there's Hogan, there's there's Bruno, but like in between there is Bob Backlund. <laughs> that, uh, but yeah, anyway, because uh, Bob Backlund, what, beat Superstar Billy Gray and then lost it to the Iron Sheik and then the Sheik quickly dropped it to Hogan and away we go with uh, what become the, the rock and roll uh, wrestling days, I guess, but yeah, just a bit of a strange one. Uh, right, T on a B has got another Roman Reigns question. When was the last time Roman won a match without any help? The Bloodline story may be the best thing in years, but his matches don't feel must-see. Well, when was the last time he won clean? You know what? Um... I could not tell you off the top of my head. I probably should have researched this, but uh, the uh, the whole point of like how long people put up with his matches, it depends what you're into with your wrestling. Uh, Roman Reigns works a very uh, methodical style, should we say, a slow style. Uh, some would say a slog style. It's just, it's very plodding. Um, it was something that he kind of he honed during the, the, the pandemic days where obviously there was no crowds there. So it was more about kind of express yourself to an audience so he slowed the pace down there'd be more trash talking because obviously that was picked up better by the microphones then because no crowds and so Roman kind of adapted that more methodical style during that and he's kind of continued a variation of that on uh, once the crowds opened up once the world opened up and here he is where yes it is a little bit formulaic you know his big pay-per-view moments or sorry PLE moments matches uh, are going to be somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes sometimes maybe 40 minutes and it's going to be a very deliberate slow pace uh and it's gonna there's gonna be roman you know dominating then it's gonna be the baby face it's gonna fire up they're gonna hit their signature spots they're gonna get a near fall or two maybe a near submission then there's gonna be shenanigans from the bloodline and that is exactly what we saw yesterday from because <laughs> there, there was there was the Ellie Knight hit his blunt force trauma and it was like, oh my God, is he going to pin him? Oh no, his Roman's foot's been put on a rope. Oh, here's Jimmy Uso. Oh, here we go. There's a barricade spot and then and in we go into the ring and one, two, three with a spear. So yeah, I, I think in terms of whether how long people can tolerate that, uh, the Roman Reigns matches, uh, that is all down to your personal taste. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with them. I think because 
for better or for worse, they're so sparingly. Like we haven't seen Roman wrestle since SummerSlam. So it's not like you're getting these matches every single week where it's like, oh man, here he goes, another 30 minutes of... Yeah. But then also the argument is that, I mean, he is a fighting champion. I'm not saying you should be on TV every week wrestling, but come on, man. If you've not, not had a match since August, that's there's there's a fine line there. Uh, Travis Zachary's got in touch with one last question. How many Hitmans will it take to defeat the 150 million Hitman? One. That's all it takes. It, it just takes... Bret Hart would easily deal with, with Grayson Waller. Or was it Austin Theory? <laughs> like I, I it was Austin Theory, wasn't it? Or was it... Uh, I don't know. The Hitman would take both of those on easily. Handicap match. Yeah, there we go. Bret the Hitman Hart for the win, always. Always nice to end a video with a mention of Bret. I have to get Bret in there somewhere. Uh, anyway, I've been Andrew Pollard. This has been the Solo Sunday News here at What Culture Wrestling. I hope you're well. I hope the rest of your Sunday goes well. I believe it's brothers Murray and Wilborn back tomorrow with the news. I could be talking out my hoop and be completely wrong, but somebody will be here with the news and it won't be me. So have fun. I'm off to write collision ups and downs. I'll catch you later.